Darkness had fully arrived when my supper was finished. I had sat for a bit longer enjoying another cup of coffee. Naomi had reported that the submersible dry dock had been flooded and the outer sea barrier was now open. The vessel was in the process of maneuvering down a long tunnel to emerge in the deep river channel. I asked how it was that the channel could remain without silting up, and I was told there was a system of camouflaged underwater dredges and suction hose equipped work units that had been keeping the tunnel mouth clear for decades. It had even filled the dredged out deep channel outside the construction cavern with huge water filled bladders to keep it cleared and silt free until needed. This had kept any satellites from noticing the deeper pool in the river bottom. I had finished a second cup of coffee when Naomi piped up. Joan, we will be ready to depart in the aircraft to rendezvous with the submersible in approximately 15 minutes. Thank you, Naomi. I wondered at the advanced warning until I realized that my bladder could use emptying. I walked back to the igloo shelter to use the head. As I sat there, I wondered if the advance notice had been provided to give me time to take a piss. Were the AIs that smart? Of course they were. They probably had the optimal schedule planned down to the second and were fully aware of my biological requirements. A short time later, I made it to the hangar clearing. I was using the goggles to see the dark path, and when I got to the hard surface clearing, I found that Habu was outside her shelter with the thruster fan wings already unfolded and deployed. The camouflage canopy had been retracted and the clear star-filled sky was visible. In the view through the goggles, Naomi had overlain the fan shrouds with red avoidance arcs, and I made sure to stay clear of them in the darkness. With the low-mounted shrouds so near the path to the cockpit, I realized it would be dangerous and maybe impossible to approach the cockpit while they were turning at speed. Hopefully, the motors were powerful enough to get them up to flight speed from a standstill if I was in a hurry. The cabin hatch was opening, and the inside of the cockpit was lit with a faint glow providing plenty of illumination for the goggles. I got myself seated and strapped in as the hatch closed and sealed beside me. I removed the goggles to enjoy the full, amazing view the inside of the cockpit would provide, and sure enough, the forest came alive as the aircraft projected a light-enhanced view of its surroundings onto the inside of the canopy shell. The four fans started turning and quickly spun up to take off speed. There was a bit of vibration to let me know that Habu was alive. On the right armrest of the seat, a control stick swiveled up and into a position near where my right hand would naturally rest. Take us up, Joan. Okay. The AI must have known what I was capable of, and it also must have known I was familiar with the control systems used on Flipper and Shadow. That means Habu must be controlled the same way. I grabbed the stick and hit the thumb switch for up. The spinning lift fan blades changed pitch and up we went smoothly and quickly. I took us up to a hundred meters and began to move us forward. The enhanced image of the forest below and the river and sound nearby were amazing. And I flew us around the area. Naomi projected icons onto the view screen indicating points of interest in the nearby area and explained what each was. The igloo and cafe clearing were located but I could not see much of anything from the air with the camouflage over both places. I noticed that two of the icons were in the air and moving and learned that agent had a pair of drones up to watch our flight and provide a communication relay. Naomi suggested that I take us up a bit higher and put the aircraft through its paces. I did so and as I tilted the stick forward, the fans swiveled forward and away we went. After a minute of heading east, we were well out over the ocean and moving at over 400 kilometers per hour when Habu's speed stopped climbing. The wind noise was very low, which I commented on. The canopy shell is coated with a vibration-reducing membrane and the interior has active noise cancellation. I banked Habu around to head back to shore and we turned quickly. I noticed that the fans could be angled outwards a bit along with swiveling forward and this helped with certain maneuvers. At the beach area, I pulled the stick back and brought us into a hover. We were down low at around 30 meters, and I saw the sand and scrub blowing in the downblast. I asked Naomi about the heat our motors must be producing. Joan, the motors are shielded and actively cooled with the heat being transferred by the superconducting energy conduits back from the motors to the main fuselage. Some is bled off by ducted radiators when the aircraft is in motion. The heat can also be stored in an onboard heat sink block to provide a short window of very stealthy flight if required. 
The block may be jettisoned if needed. The AI continued to instruct me on how to fly Habu. The seat controls on the left armrest were explained, and I found that I could rotate the seat forward so I could look straight down over my feet and legs to see the ground directly below. The straps held me in place snugly while trying this. The controls also allowed me to rotate the seat back and even recline the backrest a bit. I imagined I'd be able to sleep just fine in this position. Naomi showed me how to find and retrieve the urine collection apparatus stored below the seat. I did not test it out. There were also four undergarments for other bodily needs. Next, she caused a section of the front of the cockpit shell to become visible. There was a downfolding door, which when opened, led to a small adjacent chamber located in the front fuselage ahead of the pilot compartment. This chamber was about the size of a small microwave oven. I learned that since we had virtually unlimited electrical power, there was enough to utilize a miniature item replicator like Agent had used in the field bases in construction facility. This miniature unit would provide me with food, drink, and other small items. Naomi explained that this device was fed by a couple of small storage bins located in the nose which contained raw organic materials. These were broken down by a compact reduction unit, and the base materials were used to recreate almost any consumable I could think of, as long as it was based upon simple organics. Most simple foods, drinks, or even organic toilet paper could be made by the device. This could include useful items like clothing, fiber rope, or canvas. Habu also could make its own water by precipitating it out of the air from atmospheric moisture although a tank could be filled to speed up the process. Naomi also demonstrated that by rotating the seat and compartment forward a bit further, the forward cabin door now opened to a long compartment located along the bottom of the forward fuselage. This space was just big enough for a human being to lie in if needed. Too bad I lacked anyone to carry. This small cargo bay had an exterior access hatch along the bottom of the fuselage, similar to a bomb bay door on a traditional aircraft. The fuselage behind the cabin was filled with the DET and other gear needed by the aircraft to operate. Naomi, what if I want to carry a larger load? The aircraft has the power and lift capacity to carry almost a metric ton of cargo slung from exterior hardpoints along the bottom of the fuselage. On board the submersible in the hangar pressure hull are various sized nested cargo shells. These were designed to carry most foreseeable gear needed for your expedition to Sri Lanka, Joan. With most of the features of the aircraft demonstrated or further explained, we angled off to head over to Cumberland Sound, where the submarine waited on the surface. I loved the aircraft and Habu was the perfect name. When we approached the location of the parked boat, I asked Naomi to turn off the night vision portion of the cabin view. The view turned black and I could see starlight reflected in the black waters below. A black hole was ahead which must have been the submarine. Joan, you must observe the deployment of the hangar the AI turned the view back to full night vision and the black boat came alive. With the light enhancement, I could see dim flashing lights along the upper surface of the boat. There were also faint markings indicating a rectangular area centered on the upper surface of the boat. This would be Habu's landing pad. Naomi added brighter simulated markings and the outline of the boat's shape stood out more clearly. The boat was riding deep with a bit less than two meters of hull showing above the waterline. Suddenly near the bow, the three outer casing hatches opened. A wide curved hatch opened forward at the bow, and just aft of it, two more hatches opened to each side. Inside, lit by a series of dim lights, I could see the front curved pressure hull of the hangar pod. The aft pressure bulkhead detached from the rear of this hull and tilted backwards slightly, giving the hangar hull a bit of clearance. The entire hangar hull then rose up at the rear as it rotated around a point near the front of the tapered cylindrical hull. As it tilted upwards to about 40 degrees, I could easily see inside the hollow pressure hull as it was much brighter with its white colored interior visible. This was where Habu and I would be in a few minutes. Before we flew down to land, I watched a long heavy grappling arm extend up and out of the tilted hull. The arm hinged and bent down to lay flat on the upper deck. Naomi took over and Habu started down. As we descended near the sub, we rotated around so the open hangar hull at the bow of the sub was behind us. I tilted the seat forward a bit so I could see the rectangular markings of the landing pad approaching below us. 10 seconds later, Habu touched down with a soft bump directly in the center of the rectangle. 
I could now see the retraction and deployment arms extend under us and latch onto the underside of the aircraft. Once we were securely in its grasp, Habu started folding in all four wings and lift fans. As it was doing that, the arm below lifted us about 10 centimeters above the deck and started to pull us back into the hangar hull. As we got near the hull's rim, the arm rotated us up into the air so we'd enter at the same angle as the tilted hull. Naomi rotated the pilot's seat forward as Habu tipped back, keeping me level. Back and into the pressure hull we went. Once we stopped moving, the landing legs of Habu were latched to the floor decking of the hangar hull. I watched mechanical arms connect various umbilicals to the rear of the aircraft. Next, the hull started to tilt back down into the submarine, and I watched the stars vanish as the upper lip of the hull's curved opening slid below the rim of the sub beyond. With a bump, the tilting hull stopped in a level position and moved slightly in the aft direction. This brought the rim of the hangar hull into contact with the aft dome. The rim was circular and contained dozens of huge locking lugs, which were being retracted by a huge system of gears and drive screws. Once the lugs were fully closed, the hangar hull would be pressure sealed to the rest of the submarine. I hoped its gaskets were foolproof. My seat was now rotated back to level also and I saw the rear pressure bulkhead of the round hull tilt forward and engage large anchor lugs all the way around the perimeter of the circular mating surface. Once that happened, the view screen cut out, lights came on, and Habu's left side hatch started opening. I stepped onto the walkway and stood beside Habu looking around the hangar. The aircraft fit the circular space nicely with about a meter clearance to all sides. I saw the starboard side had a handrail and a wider walkway, which explained why we were brought in backwards. Directly in front of the nose of the rearward facing Habu was a round 150 centimeter hatch in the large round bulkhead. The hatch was making loud mechanical noises. I asked why. Joan, the round hatch leads to a short tunnel which ends in the next pressure hull. Well, let's go see the sub, Naomi. I had to watch my head as I walked around the front folded wing since the curved hull sloped inward. Once I was standing at the front of Habu, there was more clearance and I could stand fully upright. The exit tunnel hatch cover slid to the side and I ducked to enter the transfer tunnel. This tunnel was a bit over a meter long and its insides were slick as if it were a telescoping cylinder. There was a second hatch on the other end of the tunnel which was sliding aside as I approached. I left the tunnel and entered the main pressure hull of the submarine. Agent had explained during my exterior inspection this morning that this hull contained the living quarters, the engine room, and the workshop bay. This must be the workshop bay. I was standing on a meter-wide catwalk almost two meters above the floor of the large chamber. The catwalk extended sideways and met the curved hull at two more round pressure hatches. These must lead out of the main pressure hull and into the twin spons and pressure hulls on each side of the sub. I noticed beside me that a ladder ran up to an overhead hatch. This must be the exit to topside. I stood at the catwalk railing facing the stern of the sub and observed the workroom. It was brightly lit with white-colored curving walls and ceiling. The room was five and a half meters across near the floor, and the walls on each side curved up, forming the ceiling four meters high. This meant that the room filled the entire upper two-thirds of the six-meter diameter main pressure hull. From the catwalk I was standing on at the front of the space, it was more than five meters to the rear bulkhead. This made the total floor dimensions below the catwalk almost six meters by six meters. Centered on the rear wall of the workroom chamber at the floor level was a large sliding door. The door was a meter wide and almost two meters tall and slid to one side like a barn door instead of swinging into the room. There was a workbench on the aft port side of the room. Under the catwalk on both the port and starboard sides were large pieces of equipment resembling an automated machining center. I asked Naomi what they were. The machine on the port side is an automated fusion and welding center. Joan, the machine on the starboard side as an augmented three-dimensional printer. Below the floor of this room in the bilge spaces are a larger reduction machine and a matching fabrication machine. Parts or items up to a cubic meter can be fabricated. If larger parts are needed, they can be assembled in modules, but the cubic meter limit matches the hull hatch size and anything larger would need to be joined outside the submarine via fusion welding, sintering, or even by using various fasteners. Naomi, do the rooms and chambers of the sub have speakers allowing me to hear your actual audio voice? 
I'd like to hear what you sound like with real echoes instead of in the center of my head. At, oh, I'm not. I said. Yes, Joan, the vessel does have auditory pickups and speakers in all its chambers. Does my auditory voice appeal to you? Naomi asked. Yes, it did. She sounded exotic and sexy. Um, yes, it does. Thank you. I looked to each side of the catwalk and saw a tiny hatch and ladder by one end leading to the floor below. There had to be a better way. How do I get down from this catwalk? Instead of answering, the middle section of the catwalk I was standing on started to drop to the floor of the large chamber. The railing in front of me was my handhold. When it was lowered, I was able to step around the railing on either side next to the fusion machine or the 3D printer. I found the flooring to be rubbery and with good traction. It was a light gray colored and mostly seamless. I did detect the outlines of various access hatches, which I suspected allowed fabricated items to be raised from the machines below. The workbench on the aft port side of the room was well equipped. I saw many familiar tools along with many I had no idea about. There were two vices of differing sizes along with two wall-mounted robotic arms. I suddenly had the image of the arms putting away the tools automatically, and I chuckled as this used to be the bane of my home workshop nine centuries ago. Over the bench was a series of task lights and even a flexible fume hood. Looking up, I saw near the ceiling was a small bridge crane. Its main beams spanned the room bow to stern right below the curved ceiling. Hanging from those beams was a smaller movable crossbeam with a movable crane. The crane featured a compact powered cable hoist with a complicated gripper. I could see how this crane system could be used to lift heavy fabrications out of the floor hatches and reposition them elsewhere in the room, even up onto the catwalk. The curving wall on the starboard side of the room was covered with storage compartments of various sizes and shapes. I wondered if they were empty or full, but there was plenty of time to inspect those later. The last thing I noted was a pedestal cleanup sink in front of the rear starboard bulkhead. It was freestanding in front of the bulkhead, which allowed room, so the big rear sliding hatch could be left open behind it. I approached the sliding hatch and pressed the actuator detente. The hatch slid sideways, and I got my first look at what were clearly my living areas beyond. I stood there with my mouth open. Beyond was another large space over five meters deep and spanning the entire width of the six meter pressure hull. The ceiling was the same four meters as the large workshop. What made my mouth drop was not the size of the space, but what I could see through the curving walls and ceiling. They were transparent and outside I saw clear blue ocean waters. The waters were filled with colorful fish darting about, swimming sharks, octopi, sea turtles, even a few whales far off in the distance. Wow, it looked like a huge glass tunnel under the sea extending the five meters between the front and rear bulkheads of the space. I could even hear the rushing of an ocean current and bubbling noises in the songs of the whales. Naomi just let me stand there a moment, taking it all in. Finally, I recalled we were in the Cumberland Sound and not in the ocean itself, which meant that this vision was not possible. I was about to ask if it was a projection when the image changed. What appeared next was a perfect view of a beach. The formerly dim blue room grew very bright and light. There were clouds drifting by in the blue sky shown in the ceiling. Off to the port side was a series of beach dunes with grasses waving in the breeze. Off to starboard was the beach itself with the ocean waves ebbing into the sand. I could hear the roar of the surf and the gulls in the sky. I even smelt the salt air and felt the breeze blowing in my face. Eat your heart out, Disney. You never had a room like this. After 30 seconds, the view changed again. Replacing the beach scene was a forested evening scene. The room grew darker with a twilight horizon off to the port and a dark star-filled sky above. To the starboard side was a moonlit meadow with a small brook leading to a pond. I could hear the water burbling as it fell. The smell of pine trees replaced the salt air. This was fucking amazing. I stood frozen, taking it all in. After a few dozen seconds more, the image faded and the walls and ceiling turned to a uniform, cool, white-lit surface. This allowed me to gather myself and take in the normal parts of the room. I realized right away that this was the main salon area. From where I stood facing aft in the opening coming from the workroom, beside me to the right or port side of the room facing forward was a small kitchenette. 
It appeared to have all the basics like a small refrigerator, a microwave, and a pair of small heating elements. Aft of the kitchenette was an island with a sink. The island was about 130 centimeters square, and it had a sink and faucet facing the kitchenette and a stool and a seating overhang on the rear or aft side. The island had enough room on the port side of the room to walk between it and the curving wall of the pressure hull. Behind the island's stool area and facing towards the port side aft area of the room, the wall was filled with a home office type work area. Above this was built-in shelving. The work counter had knee space with an office type chair mounted on a short sliding track on the floor. There was a screen on the work counter and a standard looking mouse and keyboard. The first I'd seen of either device in over nine centuries. I turned to face the starboard side of the room. Beside me on the front wall was a fireplace with a large view screen above it. The bulkhead the fireplace was built in was only 10 centimeters thick, so it must have been a simulation. Above the fireplace and below the view screen was Anna's machete, which had been mounted on a polished hardwood plaque. I approached it and ran my finger over the surface of the handle, remembering Anna and all I had learned from her. In front of the fireplace and centered on the starboard curving hull was a low, comfortable looking sofa. I walked over and sat. It was plush and very soft and its short back did not restrict the view of the curved hull too much. A few meters in front of both the sofa and the fireplace sat a swiveling reclining chair. This looked to be the focal point of the room and I got up to try the chair out. The swivel chair reminded me of an old leather Ames chair. It had a molded headrest and could recline to be almost flat. I could turn it to face anywhere in the room. I turned in the chair, checking out the room further. The flooring was still rubbery, but this room had a hardwood floor look to it. There was even a rug in front of the chair and sofa. I turned to face the fireplace at the starboard front corner of the room, and as I looked it over, it lit. Where before it was a shallow looking artificial recess in the wall, now it was a realistic three-dimensional projection of a burning fire. I could see a real looking wood fire burning. I could feel the heat on my skin, hear the crackling of the wood and even smell just a hint of wood smoke. Well done, Agent and Naomi. I swiveled the chair around to face the rear of the room. Centered on the aft wall of the room was a stairwell that led up about seven steps or about a meter and a half. The stairs were a generous meter wide and I could see a corridor extending further aft from the top of the stairs. There were chrome rails on either side of the stairs which looked like those I'd seen on boats before. To the starboard of the upstairs was a similar set of downstairs. These were offset more towards the starboard hull. I could not see what was down past those stairs as there was a closed door at the bottom. In the corner of the salon between the downstairs and the curved hull, was a lush, well-shaped two-meter dwarf fruit tree in a semi-recessed pot in the floor. The tree started glowing a vibrant green as ground lights below and spots above came on. Naomi, what kind of tree is that? It's real, right? Yes, Joan. The species is a hybrid and it has graftings of lemon, orange, and lime. The lighting and nutrient and water supplies are automated and the tree should bear fruit occasionally throughout the year. I slowly spun the chair around. After a minute, Naomi spoke up. I hope you find the room pleasing, Joan. The AI known as Agent left most of the finished details of this vessel up to me. It had prepared and instructed me to deeply study your memories, to find scenes and accoutrements which would give you pleasure and promote calm and satisfaction. Were my choices satisfactory? Did I detect a hint of vulnerability in the machine's question? Yes, Naomi, I am pleased. You did a wonderful job. I stood up and headed towards the upstairs. As I climbed the stairs, I noted they were just a bit steeper and with shallower treads than a residential stair. At the top was a corridor about six meters long. The corridor had a flat ceiling at a bit over two meters in height. There were a pair of doors on each side of the corridor and a large hatch at the rear. The doors on the sides were not swing doors, but were metal pocket doors. The first pair on both sides were open and I chose the starboard door first. Inside was the head. The space was about two meters square with a bite taken out of it where the downstairs needed headroom in the adjacent salon. Entering the room, there was a vanity to the left, filling in above the bite area, a deeper shower stall beside it next to the outer wall, and a head straight ahead on a short angled wall between the outer hull and the wall to the next compartment aft. 
The outer wall of the room curved and sloped inward steeply, which made sense as we were now higher in the circular pressure hull. The curving outer wall stopped at the flat ceiling, which matched the height of the quarter ceiling at a bit over two meters. I asked Naomi if the curving outer wall could show images like the sail on walls and ceiling did, and she answered by causing a vivid jungle image to appear, complete with a full-size tiger just beginning to leap towards me. Jesus Christ, I jumped. What the hell? She just pranked me. I got my heart back under control and simply thanked her for the demonstration. I thought I heard an electronic snickering, but I'm sure that was just my imagination. Across from the head on the port side of the quarter was my berth. This space was two meters deep by three meters long. Centered on the front bulkhead was a double-sized bunk. It was just a normal bed, but I was feeling quite navel by this point. There was just enough room to squeeze along each side of the bed, which would help in making the bed. On the aft wall near the outer sloped hull was a small dresser. The rear wall also had a decent sized view screen. I sat on the end of the bed and found it to be like memory foam. Very plush, I later learned it was fully adjustable and even inclined. As I sat on the bed inspecting the room, I looked at the curved outer wall. Naomi, be warned that if you project a jump scare image at me again, I'm going to find your main processor cabinet to start pulling wires. I wondered what she would make of my idle threat. An image of a herd of placid grazing sheep appeared. I smugly took my victory. Joan, be aware that I am starting to maneuver the submarine down the East River and out of Cumberland Sound to head towards the open ocean where we may submerge and navigate freely. Use caution as you walk about the vessel. Also, do you wish to observe our passage from the open air at the top of our sail? Naomi said. What the hell? We did not have a sail, did we? Um, yeah, I want to see that. Where to? I asked. Proceed forward to the workroom and up and into the port side Sponson Hall. You will need goggles and a long sleeve shirt would be prudent. There is such a garment in the lower drawer in the chest in front of you. Also, a pair of gloves would be warranted. These can be found in the workroom, Naomi said. I found the shirt and put it on over the one I had on. I put my goggles on and headed out of my berth, down through the lounge and forward to the workroom. I found the gloves where Naomi said they were stored and headed up the lift to the catwalk and then left to the port side sponson. The circular hatch to that sponson was already open and I entered. Through the hatch was a short one meter long tunnel leading to the sponson. I had to ascend two steps as I transited the sloped tunnel because the sponson floor was 30 centimeters higher than the level of the catwalk. The sponson was simply lit with just a dim red light and I realized it was so my eyes would adjust to the darkness above. The first chamber inside the sponson was four meters long, and since the sponson was just under three meters in diameter, there was plenty of room to stand. The front of this chamber had a bunch of equipment and small hatches that reminded me of a torpedo room from a U-boat. The aft end ended in a curved rear pressure bulkhead. In the bulkhead was a heavy rectangular pressure hatch with rounded corners and large dogs. Naomi said this led to the diving preparation area, airlock, and moon pool. The curved port wall of the sponson was all solid storage lockers. I could see what looked like diving gear through the locker's mesh doors. She then directed me to a small hatch located a meter aft of the access tunnel I had just entered. This hatch was on the curved surface of the pressure hull and located upward at an angle about where the wall ended and the ceiling began in the cylindrical sponson hull. There was a short ladder leading up to the hatch. Joan, this hatch leads to the base of the extendable sail. You can only open it and enter when the sail is rotated in the upright position and drained of seawater. The sail is a narrow four meter long tunnel, which when retracted rests under the deck between the curves of the primary hull and this sponson. Long hatches on the deck casing open to allow the sail to rotate upwards to a vertical position. This hatch connects to the base of the sail. Further aft of the retracted sail exists similar retractable photonics and radar mass. The photonics mast is what you will use in place of a periscope. The vessel has four masts of various types. The sail is now fully upright, drained, and accessible. You may enter. The dim indicator beside the hatch turned from flashing red to green. The hatch wheel motor began to spin and the dogs retracted. When the hatch had opened, I looked in and up and saw a ladder lit by a dim red light. 
I climbed up and through the hatch and hung on the ladder inspecting the sail tunnel. It was an elliptical-shaped tube with the long axis aligned with the long axis of the sub. There was just enough room in the tube for me and the ladder. I grabbed a higher rung and started up. I climbed over three meters and then came to an overhead hatch. An indicator on the hatch showed green and I pulled the handle, releasing the dogs holding it down. I pushed the hatch up and it swung to the side. I squeezed through and found myself in a basket-shaped bridge about a meter in width and a bit longer. I noticed the basket had operable sides that could fold up when the sail retracted. I turned to face forward and through the goggles saw that the submarine was cruising down the sound in between the shores on either side. I turned and saw we were putting out a good wake. Can the satellite see that wake? I asked. It is highly unlikely, Joan. There are no satellites overhead for the next 40 minutes. Also, the enemy AI presences do utilize surface vessel transportation and any passive scanners would ignore such a wake if it detected them unless specifically directed to record them. With no lights on shore or moon above due to the increasing cloud cover, the surface view in the darkness was less than impressive. The goggles allowed me to see clearly though, and the spray and bow waves were impressive. I was glad that Naomi reminded me to grab the extra shirt as it was cool up here, even standing behind the short windscreen at the front of the sail. I turned and looked over the sub. The sail was located near the port side edge of the flat center deck. I could see the long hatch behind the sail that would open to let it swivel down into the casing between the sponson and main hull when it needed to retract for diving. I could also make out the small circular ports where the various masts would pop up if we needed to raise a camera or radar. There were more larger circles 10 meters to the aft of the sail and I jokingly asked Naomi if they were for our missiles. That is correct, Joan. Those ports are used to vertically launch drones or small missiles. I was sobered for a moment, realizing that I had a lot to learn about the sub. I stood facing forward again, watching the shores pass by and the water split in front of the bow to be pushed aside in a big spreading wake. It was a surreal moment. Here I was a forgotten former derelict of a man who had lived in the middle of the Great Plains as far from the oceans as a man could get in the US of A. Now I had my own incredible submarine about to head out on a world-spanning adventure with enemies in all directions, ready to end my existence in a nuclear fireball. We were moving at a good clip, and after 15 minutes we began to make a wide swing to port to head the boat to the east in the Atlantic. I asked about the river channel and other hazards, and Naomi explained that Agent had extensive depth surveys which were updated constantly. Also, our hull was plenty strong enough to resist damage from a floating log or similar. As we continued the port side turn, the open ocean came into view ahead. Ten minutes more, and we were out the mouth of the river and into the ocean proper. As the boat hit the ocean, the spray started to dampen the top of the sail. I decided to go below and descended the ladder after pausing to shut the top hatch. I got below and sealed the hatch leading to the sail base. Naomi projected the images of the sail rotating backwards into its berth in the port sponson wet bay in my goggles. I could hear the groan and scrapes as the outer casing hatch closed. On the way through the workroom, I left my goggles on the workbench and made it back to the salon in time to seat myself in the recliner and watch the view from the photonics mast as we cut across the waves. Naomi said we'd move a few dozen kilometers offshore before we descended. I sat in the chair and dozed occasionally. I came awake when Naomi advised me that we were going to submerge. I heard a few pops from the hull and decks as we angled forward a bit and descended below the surface a dozen meters. The submerged sub was very quiet, and I could only hear an occasional noise as some pump or machine became active. There was also a constant faint white noise of air circulation which was reassuring and masked the noises of the more intermittent equipment. The main electric motor at the rear must have been isolated to a great degree because I did not notice it here in the lounge. I slowly spun my chair around, marveling at the vessel. I felt like Captain Nemo. I had it. This was my Nautilus, a new and better Nautilus. I'd refer to it as the Nouveau Nautilus. Naomi had activated the fireplace and dimmed the lights. I sat there in the late hour, finally caught up to me. Just before I dozed off again, I was smart enough to move over onto the sofa. Within minutes, I was on out. I never noticed the small bipedal mobile unit come into the lounge and slip a blanket over me as I slept.